that we're doing a Q&A this morning, a little bit different than our typical sermon. Um, so uh, just so you guys know, you can text in a question. Um, uh, try not to shout out a question if you can handle that. Um, you can talk to Samuel back there if you don't have the capability to text. Um, and what this is is basically you can ask any question you want. And I'll do my best to answer it on the spot. Um, here's hoping that I'm uh, truthful with uh, God's word in that. Um, and what we'd like to do is we'd like to focus on questions that were related to the most recent sermon series, right? Uh, the Calm in the Storm. And uh, just a quick recap, the first sermon of that series was um, Signs of the End Times, right? Where sometimes Christians can get really into this idea of like, all of these signs and looking for them about when is Armageddon going to happen and when is the end of the world going to happen. Um, and if you recall, I kind of said like, um, don't bother, <laughs> right? Um, that uh, the signs that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24, well, they actually happen all the time. And so um, there's, it's more like Jesus is just going to show up one day, everyone's going to know it, and until then, there is no sign specifically pointing to it. Um, there's probably some questions around that. Um, our second one was politics, right? And the temptation of politics, where it kind of dominates and um, can kind of overwhelm even just our um, view of God and view of how we're supposed to work in this world. And then the third sermon was uh, culture wars, right? So this idea that um, uh, we got to take back America for Jesus as um, fewer and fewer cr Americans call themselves Christian. Like, how do we respond to that as the church? And um, how some people respond by engaging in this culture war thing where we kind of fight with um, other forces that want to dominate the culture. And so we kind of talked about how the church was separate from the world. We invite people into the church, but we don't try to control the culture or the politics around us. So lots of food for thought there. Um, I think there was possibly some questions out there, but feel free, text in 651 three two one three three one four and i'm going to pray while y'all are texting and then um samuel is going to fire one away so um father i just want to thank you for this morning um for the time for all of us to gather for dedicating the little one to raise him to know you and father i just pray that um uh, you would help us to ask questions and father i pray that you would help me to answer them in the ways that um you would want them answered that uh, we represent your son jesus this morning um, as we tackle different topics, and Father, I just pray that um, you would make this a life-giving, um, good occasion, and people um, here in this room would learn more about you in order to grow closer to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So most of these are unscripted. I think I knew of one or two beforehand, and we might not even get to those. So Samuel, fire away. What's the first one? When did Jesus ask his disciples to not carry the sword? Okay, so some of you know I'm kind of a nonviolence proponent, right? Uh, said a few th times like Anabaptism, right? And they're known for their nonviolence, peacemaking kind of thing. And so um, you'll hear throughout my sermons a lot of like, hey guys, um, we shouldn't kill our enemies, right? Um, and that I think taking Jesus at his word that we're supposed to love our enemies, pray for them, bless them, um, kind of requires us not to stab them with swords or shoot them with guns. Um, and, and I know there's a lot of questions about that, right? Because we worry about like, well, what happens if all Christians don't do that? Or what happens if America doesn't do that? Or, you know, um, what would happen if someone breaks into my home and tries to attack my family, right? Should I defend them? So there's a lot of really good questions and wise questions in here. Um, so if you got one of those follow-up ones, I'm just going to tackle the theological question here. So when did Jesus ask his disciples to not carry the sword? Um, so the flip side of that is when did Jesus ask his disciples to carry a sword, right? Now there is one time in scripture where Jesus does this. Um, it happens in the book of Luke, and it's on the last night before he's betrayed, right? And so what he does is he tells his disciples, I want you to go and sell your possessions. I want you to sell your cloak if you have to, and go get a sword. And it's kind of this weird little passage where he's telling his disciples, the 11 that are still there, Judas has wandered off to go get the Roman authorities to, well, the Jewish authorities to come and capture Jesus. And so it's kind of this weird little story, right? And some people want to take this as like, this is the okay that we can own weapons, use weapons for like self-defense and stuff. Um, and so there is this passage that says Jesus telling his disciples, go and buy a sword. So if you just look at it for that, you could say, yes, Jesus tells us to do that. But if you look at the rest of the story as it plays out, a funny thing kind of happens, right? So Jesus tells his disciples, go buy swords. And his disciples go, oh, we've got two right here, right? They must have missed that passage about loving their enemies. They had two swords on standby. 
It is what it is, right? And so Peter, you know, he's a pretty passionate dude. Um, he was following Jesus. So he's like, I've got two swords here. And Jesus says, that's enough. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Um, there's 11 disciples and there's Jesus. There's two swords, right? Um, and, and what Judas is doing is he's going and getting like guards and a mob and they're unruly and all of them have weapons. Why is only two swords enough, right? And so what Jesus says is he says, that is enough because I have to fulfill this scripture where it says I will be counted among the transgressors, right? And uh, that scripture was from Isaiah and it was a prophecy foretold 600 years before Jesus. And what it was saying was like Jesus wanted swords among his people so that he could be accused of being riotous, of doing a revolution among the land, right? Because that's how the Romans could actually sentence him to death. Because the Romans couldn't sentence him to death just for talking or just for, you know, loving the people around him. But they could sentence him to death if they thought that he was inciting a revolution, which is what the Jewish people claim is, is what he is doing when they go before the Roman authorities to say, you need to crucify this man. Now, it's funny because as Judas and the group of unruly mob come to capture Jesus, well, what does Peter do? Well, he's like, well, Jesus told me to get a sword, right? So he goes to use it, right? And Peter's like, ah, you know, go berserker mode, like um, just like lunges at. And he, he ends up chopping at a dude and he's really bad with a sword. So maybe he did take heart, you know, Jesus's commands, but he, he lops off the ear of one person, right? Epic battle, right? Just what legends are made of. And so he lops off the ear, and then Jesus says, stop, right? Peter didn't kill anyone. Peter did nothing. He lops off the ear of this dude, and Jesus goes over, and he repairs the damage. He puts the ear back up and does a miracle, and it heals the man. And then he says, no more fighting, right? So it's really odd to me to then say, well, this verse about owning a sword is about we should use self-defense to kill other people, right? Um, or that we should be okay with guns and things like that. Like, I think we really need to wrestle with the meaning of that passage and how it was much more about fulfilling a prophecy and sort of setting away for the Roman authorities to crucify Jesus and less so about hey, you can defend yourself and have weapons and use them because Jesus says that's okay. So um, just food for thought, you know, Jesus did not start that revolution. He stopped Peter. He healed the damage that was done. It's pretty clear Jesus didn't want his disciples even defending Jesus or themselves. So when did Jesus ask his disciples to not carry the sword? There you go. It's kind of an answer. All right, Samuel, what you got next? If we should be ready any time for Jesus to come back, why doesn't the church talk about living life like he's coming back versus, well, he is back, but it will not be soon? Well, he is back, but will, it will not be soon. Coming back. coming back. He is coming back, but it will not be soon. Okay. So I think what this question is kind of asking is like, um, what's your viewpoint as a Christian, right? Um, so Jesus said 2,000 years ago that he was coming back, right? And so it hasn't happened in 2,000 years, right? Um, so we could kind of get into this sort of uh, sense of, well, he'll come back, right? But chances of it happening today or tomorrow or even next week, right? Slim to none, given our history, right? Um, and so this kind of like living life like he's coming back versus, well, he's going to come back someday, but it's off in the future, right? Now, these two lifestyles, right, one where he's coming back and it could be today, and the other one where Jesus is coming back but it could be way off in the future, people live their life differently based on how they see Jesus, right? In this one, you'd be living life every day like, I got to share the gospel, I got to obey Jesus, I got to build the kingdom of God, right? Because he could come back today, he could come back tomorrow, he's going to come back soon, and so i got to work at it. And this is kind of what we see in the first century church in the book of Acts, right? For his disciples, for Paul, they're out there, they're risking their life to live for Jesus. They're risking their life to spread that message of the gospel. They're doing everything within their power at every moment, they're selling their possessions, they're living together, they're trying to do everything to live for Jesus, right? And there's this passion, and there's this urgency that I think they have in the first century immediately after Jesus is crucified and goes to heaven. 
that he's going to come back, and he's going to come back soon, right? Now, 2,000 years later, we can kind of fall into this rhythm of like, well, he's going to come back someday, we believe that, but we might not live life urgently, passionately, right? We might just show up to church on Sunday and be like, yay, Jesus, you know, sing, listen to a dude talk for a little while, clap, and then we go home about our normal lives, right? And so what I think we should be doing is we should be living this life of passion and urgency. Because I think that's what Jesus wants his disciples to do. Um, and, and that passion and urgency, it's not so much like this, we don't have to get weird with it, right? We don't have to be like, and Jesus is coming back and we're the sandwich board, the end is near kind of stuff, right? We don't have to go that route. But I think that we should live a life as if like the gospel of Jesus is the most important thing to us. And the gospel of Jesus influences all of our actions. And I want that love to pervade every single action I do, right? And you don't have to be the weird Jesus juker where you always talk about Jesus in every single conversation, but I think it's kind of that sense of like, what do you have for me today, God? What do you want me to do today, urgently, passionately for your kingdom? And we should be asking that question of ourselves and living that life. So good question. I hope I answered it. What do you got next, Samuel? Is there biblical evidence of the rapture? Okay, who here knows what rapture means? Yep, churchy term. Okay, let me explain it real quick. So, um, end of the world, right? End times, we kind of talked about this. Um, there's some different thoughts about how that will go down, right? Um, there's some people who say, okay, Jesus is just going to come back, and then he's going to recreate everything. And that will be when the new creation comes, all sins removed, all that type of stuff. And then um, we within about the past 200 years or so, they started really diving into this idea of like, there's going to be a rapture. And what the rapture is, is um, before Jesus comes back, there's going to be a time of really bad stuff happening, right? Um, and what the rapture is, is at the beginning of that, Jesus is going to like, kind of like a vacuum, just suck up all the Christians up to heaven so that they don't have to live through the really bad times. And then God will bring them back down. And that's when um, sort of the final judgment will happen. All creation is recreated and all the evil will be gone and sin's gone, right? And so in this idea of the rapture, um, it's kind of this idea of like, okay, w when will that happen? Is there biblical evidence for it, right? Because um, who here wants to live through really bad end of the world stuff? Anyone? Yeah, that doesn't sound fun, right? Um, so is there biblical evidence for it? Um, maybe? <laughs> Uh, the thing here is that, like, when, when people read, say, like, Matthew 24, like we studied with signs of the end times, right? So it taught, the disciples were like, Jesus, when are you coming back? When is all this bad stuff happening? Um, what will be the signs that this is about to happen? They had this question just like we have this question, right? And Jesus goes on to list some really bad stuff. He's like famines, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars. Christians are going to be persecuted. They're going to turn against each other. They're going to kill each other. You're going to be killed and persecuted. Like, just really bad stuff, right? And um, what, what we've kind of done is we've taken that passage of Jesus saying those things, and we've said, okay, at the end of the world, that's going to happen, right? Right? And we kind of call that the tribulation, the bad times before Jesus comes back. And there's some passages about like, um, especially in Revelation about the, the saints being taken up to heaven and waiting. And there's some passages in Revelation about that. So it kind of depends on how you read Revelation, right? Is Revelation the future prophecy of the end of the world and all the bad stuff that's going to happen in sequential order? And at the beginning of that, People are taken up to heaven who believe so that they avoid all that bad time. Now, what I was saying during the signs of the end time thing is like, okay, famines, earthquakes, persecution, wars, rumors of wars. When has that not happened? Like, it's been going on since before Jesus, right? There's actually nothing new there. And I think that's what Jesus was getting at. He was like, look, um, everybody's going to be looking for these signs, and they're going to point and be like, Israel just went to war. Did you guys read that on the news? And that's a part of the end times. Because look, here in Revelation, it talks about these people attacking Israel. So therefore, that's the end of the world, and we need to, you know, build our bunkers, or we need to buy those, like, five-year supply of freeze-dried food and put it in our basement, or whatever it is, right? But Jesus tells those signs to say, don't be misled. 
is what he says. He says, don't be misled by anyone. There's going to be all of these things, and everyone's going to be pointing at those along the way to say, oh, look, there's Jesus. There's the Messiah. Here he's coming. This is the sign. And Jesus says, don't be misled by that. And what he ends his time with, he says, and then finally there's going to be this sign that the Son of Man is coming. And he says it's going to be so like everyone's going to know it. Christian, non-Christian, they're going to know that's the sign that Jesus is coming back. And he doesn't really say what it is. <laughs> Thanks, Jesus, right? Um, but he kind of says, like, this idea of, like, if you want to be my disciple, and here's how I read sort of Revelation and things like that, is, like, um, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be arrested, you're going to be killed for your faith. There's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors of wars and all that type of stuff. But don't get too caught up in when I'm coming back and preparing for that. He says, I'm going to come like a thief in the night. No one's going to know it, right? And instead, I think Jesus just wants to focus on what is here this day, today? What am I doing for the kingdom of God here today? Um, and by saying that, I think it's sort of wor not, that we're not supposed to worry about like, well, is it the rapture? Is it the tribulation? How long does the tribulation last? Is it seven years? Is it a thousand years? Um, and then is it the pre-millennial or post-millennial or amillennial like understanding of like you get into this really weird theology stuff and i think jesus is telling his disciples like look the end of the world is going to happen i'm going to come back i'm going to make things right i'm going to remove sin from creation but don't worry about that worry about this what you're doing in your life today so is there biblical evidence of the rapture maybe um, and, and it could be like you're sucked up and immediately brought. I don't know how it works. Like, <laughs> it depends on how you read Revelation. And Revelation is super weird and a lot of Old Testament stuff in there. Ryan preached a sermon back in February about it. Check that out on our YouTube page um, for some other idea about that. So next question, Samuel. I kind of answered that maybe. You mentioned the sacrilegious object that causes desecration in the holy place as a sign of the end times but didn't explain it. What is that? Um, it's cool. <laughs> so in the Greek and in the Hebrew, it's called the abomination of desolation, right? Which is just like an awesome metal band name, right? <laughs> like, I'm surprised it hasn't been taken that. And um, what happened was, 600 years before Jesus, there's this book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, it says there's going to be this abomination of desolation that's going to be set up in the temple. And that is a sign of the end times, okay? Um, and it doesn't really go a lot into, like, what that thing is. But um, with that language in the Old Testament, what it meant was, like, this ritually impure, unclean, like, idol being set up in the temple. Now, the temple for the people of Israel was where God dwelled. And you had the temple grounds where the temple was built. And then you had, even inside of those temple grounds, what was called the Holy of Holies, and the Holy of Holies was behind this huge curtain. People couldn't go there. They believed that's where God dwelled. And if you went in there ritually impure, God would strike you down, dead, right? So they would literally, like, tie a rope to the people that went in there just in case they missed something so that they could drag them back out because they're not going to go in to retrieve the body, right? So when this sacrilegious object or this abomination of desolation or sacrilegious object that causes desecration in Matthew 24, as it said, um, Jesus said that's going to be a sign of the end times. So, there's a couple theories about what this thing was. Um, and there's been a couple times where um, some uh, drastic things have happened. So, let me just give you a quick history lesson. In the beginning, no. Um, Israel, 600 years before Jesus. It's conquered by, well, most of it was conquered by the Assyrians. And they left Jerusalem and the temple still up and running, the Assyrians did. They didn't conquer that portion, but they conquered like 11 of the 12 tribes in the northern section, right? 10 of the 12, because the Levites aren't landowners. Anyway, um, moving on. So Jerusalem is still there. Well, the Babylons, the Babylonians come back and they conquer Assyria and then they finish the job. The Babylonians come in, they conquer Israel, and what they do is they destroy the temple. And this is where God lived for the Israelites. So this was like a really super bad thing. And the Babylonians then took the Israelites out of the land and brought them back to Babylon. And when you're in Babylon, one of those dudes' names was Daniel. And what God did was he spoke to Daniel and he gave him some prophecy and he said, 
um, there's this future stuff that's going to happen, and it's really weird, and there's a lot in there. But he says one of the things that's going to happen is this abomination of desolation in the temple. And Daniel's going, well, the temple's already been destroyed. Like, what's going on here, right? And so what happens is, is about 300 years later in Israelite history, um, the, I think it was the Greek king Cyrus, don't quote me on this, I'm kind of bad with dates and stuff, but about 300 years later, um, the Greeks kind of take over and they say, okay, Israelites, you can go back to your land and I'm going to give you materials to rebuild the temple. And they're like, yeah, we can rebuild the temple, we could start up our religion again and things like that, right? And so they go back and they do this, um, but they're still not a nation, right? They're just a people living under the Greeks still, but they're allowed to rebuild the temple and rebuild the Holy of Holies. And then what happens is um, at about 130 BC, w there was a rebellion within Israel to sort of like declare their own country. And the Greeks come in and they completely destroy that rebellion. And a lot of Israelites died. Now what happens is, is at 130 BC, um, the conquering general goes into the Holy of Holies. And then he sets up a statue of Zeus in the middle of the Holy of Holies. Now, this would be something that would characterize the abomination of desolation, right? Something impure, not of God, that could, was set up in that spot. So that could have been one possible scenario there. Um, the other one could have been when the Romans came after Jesus died, right around 68 AD. They came in and they actually destroyed the temple again. Um, and it's still that way. Like, the temple is gone right now, except for the Wailing Wall, you may have heard of it. That's like the western wall of the temple. And so the temple is kind of gone. So um, that destruction could have also been an abomination of desolation type thing. Or there's kind of this theory that like at some point in the future, the temple is going to be rebuilt for a third time. Okay? And that... Um, when that temple is rebuilt, then again, there will be another sign of an abomination of desolation. Again, cool band name. Um, that will go into this holy of holy place again and desecrate it in such a way. And that could be seen as a final end time thing, right? So what was Jesus saying in Matthew 24 when he included this in the list? Good question. Um, we don't quite know for sure if that like 130 BC thing was what he was maybe talking about or if it was the 70 AD when the Romans came in or if it's a future thing, um, but he includes it. Now, one of the funny things that he does when he includes it is he says, when this happens, he says, all the people of Judea must flee. And that's the area around the temple. And so what I think he's talking about with the sacrilegious object that causes desecration in the holy place is I think he's talking about that event that happened in 70 AD when the Romans came and destroyed the temple and um, made it ritually impure and unclean. Because I don't think it's necessarily an end time thing, and it might be a dual prophecy thing, but I think for sure it was that 70 AD thing because he tells the people around Jerusalem to flee. It's not like the whole world needs to fear this thing happening. He says this localized population run when it comes, which would absolutely describe what the Romans did in 70 AD because they killed over a million Israelites during that revolution. So I think it's that. Could be a sign of the end times. Again, I'm more focused on what are we doing here today kind of thing. All right, what do we got next, Samuel? Should we rebuke fellow Christians who wrap themselves in political and culture war fighting? <laughs> um, yeah, good question. Um, so a, let me define something here. So a Christian who wraps themselves in political and culture war fighting might be someone who um, is really into politics and really into sort of this... Um, American culture going the way that isn't how Jesus would want people to live, okay? Um, and you might see this a couple of different ways where it's like um, Facebook is like the most horrendous thing ever <laughs> for this, right? So they might be like passing memes and, you know, degrading like this uh, minority or that minority or, you know, those types of things or saying like that's a sin and they're going to hell, right? Um, or saying like we need to pass laws to prevent that kind of behavior in this world, right? Um, so do we rebuke them for doing that? Um, 
I think when, when at least I spoke about this, culture wars and this political stuff that um, is really pulling at us to like be involved with, what I said was, um, I really think that we need to examine ourselves, right, as Christians. So that plank in your own eye before the speck of sawdust out there. And the church is called to be this holy people set apart, called out of this world, right? And so I think as Christians are part of the church of Jesus, then our allegiance to anything else in the world needs to take a back seat, okay? And so what that means is like, um, what I kind of see is like, sometimes our allegiance to America or our allegiance to certain political parties or our allegiance to sort of changing the culture of America to be more Christian can sometimes get elevated to almost even with the church, where we're spending all of our time and energy talking about that stuff and not really talking about the work of the church, which is to spread the gospel and love our neighbors, right? Regardless of whatever culture we live in. So I don't think it's necessarily um, like a rebuking, because like, okay, plank in my own eye, right? Speck of sawdust in my brother's eye. But I think we do need to talk about um, how we are to be separate from the world. I think we should talk about what are the temptations of politics that divide us as the church, that divide families, and should we give in to those temptations? And I think we need to talk about um, how do you express your view as an American citizen, but still hold your citizenship of heaven as the highest authority in your life, right? And that's what I was trying to accomplish in my two sermons. Um, which is kind of saying, like, this should be your first priority. This should be what 90% of your time is spent on. This should be what you're talking about on social media and with your friends. And this is, like, what we should be spending our time on. And not this political candidate, that political candidate, this culture war topic, that culture war topic. Like, and we shouldn't be fighting over those earthly things. What we should be doing is loving on behalf of the kingdom. So... Um, rebuke's a pretty strong word. I think I would use more of like, hey, let's reflect together, <laughs> right? Um, but I think there's definitely that sense of we've got to have a real conversation about how much politics and how much the culture of America is really influencing a lot of what the church is seen for um, in our modern age. And I think we should separate ourselves from sort of that culture war, political identity stuff going on, and instead just be the church of Jesus. So, um, there you go, kind of. <laughs> uh, what's the next question, Samuel? If we aren't married in heaven, why do we get married on earth? All right, kids, cover your ears. It's sex. Um, <laughs> so, so, okay, there's a passage in Matthew where um, Jesus is a proponent of there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. Now, there were some religious leaders during Jesus' time that said there is no resurrection. Like, we're just going to go off and be spirits somewhere, right? Um, but Jesus is like, no, your body is going to be resurrected. You're going to be put back on earth in a new heaven and a new earth, okay? And so they brought to Jesus this sort of question of like, well, in Jewish law, it says um, if a guy is married to a girl and the guy dies and there is no son born yet, then that woman is supposed to marry the next brother in line, right, who is unmarried. That'd be super weird, Megan, right? Um, she's my older brother's wife. She's here this morning, right? So if Jack died, no sons, you would have to marry Adam or myself under Jewish law. Super weird. But it was meant designed to, like, um, to protect women who are widows, especially at a young age, without any sort of children to take care of them is the design behind that. But... What the religious leaders during Jesus' time go, they go, okay, well, say a brother dies, and then she marries the next brother, and that brother dies, and so she marries the next brother, on and on through seven. And no one questions, is she killing these dudes off, right? <laughs> but for the purposes, um, they say she's basically been married to seven brothers. And so the religious leaders, they go to Jesus, and they say, okay, so in this resurrection that you're preaching about, which one is she married to in heaven? Great question, Right? And Jesus goes, you guys are idiots. He said it friendly. But, but he ultimately says, um, when we are in that new creation, when we are in heaven, you're not going to be married to each other, which is kind of like a shocker, right? 
Like, if you think about it, the person you're married to, like, you're not going to be married to them in heaven. Jesus says you're going to be like the angels in heaven, whatever that means. He doesn't expound upon that. So, um, one of the things that we kind of think of, though, is that, like, that's somehow a loss, right? Like, I love my spouse. What do you mean I don't get to be married to them when I get to heaven? But I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. I think the right way of looking at it is like we have relationships here on earth, right? We got friends, we got family, we've got our spouse, we've got our kids. But the relationship that we're going to have in heaven is going to be so much better than all of these on earth. And you're going to have that relationship not just with your biological family that you might have here on earth, but you're going to have that with every single brother and sister in Christ. Okay? So it's actually this really beautiful thing that you're going to have this intimate connection with God and with other people that surpasses even our most intimate connection here on earth, marriage. So why should we get married, okay? Well, um, Jesus says uh, it's best if you don't. Be single, work on behalf of the kingdom. He says that's great. That's the ideal. But he says if you can't do that, um, you know, that's only for some people that are able to do that. He says only some can do that. Paul later expounds in 1 Corinthians by saying, um, hey, it's best to be single. He says, and, and this is why I said it's about sex. He goes, but if your lust burns so much, right? Like if you just can't handle being single and not um, uh, consummating things. I don't know. I'm trying to say this in a good way because there's kids in the room. Um, he's like, go and get married, but only be married to one person for the rest of your life. That's Paul's. Um, uh, command to the Corinthians. And so it really kind of is this idea of like, look, um, uh, be single if you can be on behalf of the kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean go out and get divorced. If you're already married, Paul says stay married. But, but what I think it's kind of saying is this idea of like kingdom first, okay, but if you can't handle that, if your um, earthly desires kind of overwhelm you, like it's good that you don't go into sin and instead get married, right? Now, I think there's more to marriage than just that. I think there's that intimate relational connection that we all kind of had that need for, right? Like, uh, good God, life is lonely, and sometimes it's even lonely in marriages, <laughs> right? But it's like that desire that each of us has to be intimately connected, to know and be known by someone, um, and to share life with someone, right? Now, in heaven, we get to do that with everyone and God. But here on earth, we kind of search for that in marriage, right? And so there's companionship, there's um, fulfilling your lustful desires in a sort of God-honoring way, and um, that's kind of what the Bible tells us. Um, we're going to skip the last song. I think we got time for one more question, Samuel. What you got for me? Thank you for including touch and sometimes... What? Tough? Is that a G? Tough. Thank you for including tough and sometimes controversial topics in your message. What is your next sermon series? Philippians. We're going back to that. And then I'm not sure exactly what's coming after that. All right, we got time for one more. Are the end times coming if the Vikings win a Super Bowl? That sure seems like a sign, right? Um, I mean, it may never come. But uh, no, that's not a sign of the end times, even though we joke about it. But um, you know, I'll definitely be looking over my shoulder to be like, is Jesus here somewhere when it actually happens, miracle and all that. Uh, one more, Samuel. That's all we got. That's all we got. All right. Everyone wants to go to lunch. Okay. So thank you for doing the Q&A. Um, there might be some excess Q&A questions that um, I might do like another recording post to YouTube, so pay attention to there. But I really enjoy these mornings just to kind of ask questions and expound upon things. Thank you for sending them in. I'm just going to pray and dismiss us this morning. Um, Father, we just want to thank you for um, a good morning of questions and answers and learning too much about history, Father. That is your history. And uh, we just pray that you would, um, Father, continue to keep that curious spirit in our hearts about what does your word say, that we don't get too stuck in our rhythms of um, uh, belief and things like that, but we're constantly searching for truth from you. And Father, um, we just pray that you would continue to give us that curious heart as we go out into the world. Father, we pray that you would give us that heartbeat and that vision for what do you want us to do today, here, Sunday, um, for your kingdom in our world. Who do you want us to love?
Who do you want us to bless? Who do you want us to pray for? Father, who can we be the hands and feet of your son, Jesus, so that we can change the world through the church and make the difference that you want us to make? Father, we just pray that you would um, give us that vision, give us the energy to do that, give us a clear idea, Father, and um, that we would be a part of your kingdom working here and now. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.